Thank you for your interest in my DNP work focused on improving the effectiveness of the informed consent process and elective aesthetic procedures. Recorded here is my final defense presentation delivered December 18th, 2018 at Emory University, Nell Hodgson Woodruff School of Nursing for successful completion of my degree. I would like to take a moment to recognize my project team. Dr. Terry Addis is my fantastic project chair. Dr. Grant Stevens is the current president of the American Society for Aesthetic Plastic Surgery, ASAPS, and is my practice partner for this project. Dr. Thomas Hagopian and Dr. Eric Wolfswinkel are both USC plastic surgery residents and additional committee members. If you only take one thing away from this project, I want to make certain it is this. The informed consent process should work for you, not against you. We will return to this statement and explore it in detail, but I believe it is essential for it to remain at the forefront of our minds. First, we will review key concepts. We will then review where we are, where we are going, and some of the challenges and opportunities encountered and anticipated along the way. I will close with a reflection on DNP essentials and program outcomes met. To begin, I'd like to break down the project title and briefly review key concepts, starting with elective aesthetic procedures. Elective aesthetic procedures include both surgical and non-surgical medical services that aim to restore or enhance physical form to meet the aesthetic goals of the individual patient and are considered medically unnecessary. The most popular surgical procedure being breast augmentation and non-surgical procedure being Botox. The informed consent process. What comes to mind? Likely a similar image to this. But what should it be? The informed consent process is a complex intersection of ethics, law, and practice. Ethical standards for informed consent instructed that it should be a process of bi-directional communication. This requires meaningful participation by at least two parties, the clinician and patient or patient representative. During this process, the nature, risks, benefits, and alternatives of the proposed treatment are disclosed by the clinician and understood by the patient. The patient discloses their individual goals, informed preferences and values, which must then be understood by the clinician. The patient and clinician are then able to participate in a dialogue of shared decision-making, during which the patient's goals, informed preferences and values are weighted against the nature, risks, benefits and burdens of the proposed treatment and medically appropriate alternatives. This is the crux of ethics and informed consent, as it is understood that while the clinician may be the expert of the proposed treatment, the patient is the expert of his or her own experiences. The process concludes with an informed consent or refusal of the proposed treatment by the patient. Documentation of the disclosure and signed consent or refusal is required to meet the minimum legal requirements for informed consent. A key point to consider is that the one-way communication required by law seeks only disclosure, not understanding. Understanding is a prerequisite to being informed and quality information is a prerequisite to understanding. Quality information encompasses both the actual content being evidence-based, 
but also that the presentation of information is comprehensible. Furthermore, it must be explicitly acknowledged that there is a decision to be made, that is, the option for an informed refusal of treatment, or in a situation where there is more than one medically appropriate option, as is often the case with elective aesthetic procedures, the medically appropriate options. Why does this matter? You cannot make an informed decision if you do not understand a decision needs to be made, that you have options, have all information essential for decision making, and understand the material. When done properly, the informed consent process should equally represent all four pillars of bioethics. We will review each of these throughout this presentation, but I wanted to provide an overview to keep in mind. As noted, there is a legal component to informed consent. Duty to disclose is the jurisdiction of the states. With the exception of Washington State, states follow either a reasonable physician or reasonable patient standard, meaning what a reasonable patient or physician would consider material to disclose in the same circumstance. The reasonable patient standard is subject to debate on what constitutes a reasonable patient. Key opinion literature has even cited a 1% relevancy standard, meaning what 1% of the population would consider important for decision making. The reasonable physician standard often fails to address that it may be common practice to disclose information that is not based in evidence, is inaccurate, incomplete, or out of date. The burden of proof is your documentation of disclosure and consent or refusal. However, a signature on an informed consent document does not constitute informed consent nor confirms patient understanding. Effectiveness. Effectiveness is defined as the realistic potential for reliably achieving the desired outcome when a treatment or intervention is used in real life. This is contrasted with efficacy, which occurs in a highly controlled research setting where experiments attempt to control for all possible variables that may influence outcomes. This is unrealistic for quality improvement efforts as actual practice of healthcare does not and cannot occur in a vacuum. Contextualizing effectiveness to the informed consent process means that we need to reliably achieve both the ethical standard and legal requirements for informed consent without imposing additional burdens of time or expense. So what does it mean to improve and how do we do it? Improvement work aims to close the gap between common and best practice. So how do we do this? We need to know where we are, where we are going, and how we plan to get there. This requires measurement. As quality improvement teaches us, if you can't define it, then you can't measure it, and if you can't measure it, then you can't improve it. An initial needs assessment was accomplished through review of relevant peer-reviewed publications and gray literature informal interviews with plastic surgeons, plastic surgery residents, and patients, a critical review of the literature for best evidence for effective informed consent in the setting of elective aesthetic procedures was performed. Professional codes of ethics and legal doctrine were also reviewed. A gap analysis was conducted and included review of informed consent materials and informal interviews to assess local culture. We start with theory to help explain the problem, how to tackle it, and why a proposed solution is expected to work. To paraphrase Dr. Simpson, theory gives you your bumper guards to help keep you on track. 
overarching theoretical, conceptual, and operational guidance drew from complexity science, quality improvement, and derivatives of knowledge translation theory. A working causal and program theory was constructed to guide project development, implementation, and future evaluation. Patient understanding during the informed consent process is a top priority for patient safety. Unfortunately, as reported in a 2016 patient safety brief by the Joint Commission, patients frequently do not understand procedure risks, benefits, and alternatives. The Joint Commission also reported that communication issues are the most frequent root cause of serious adverse events reported to the Joint Commission's Sentinel event database. Why is this a problem? In patients presenting for elective aesthetic procedures, miscommunication during informed consent leads to uninformed treatment decisions that are discordant with patient goals and preferences and are associated with decreased patient satisfaction and increased litigation. Poor communication, specifically involving risk disclosure and understanding during informed consent, has been identified as a major contributor to most surgical malpractice litigation. A plastic surgery closed claim study was conducted by the doctor's company, the professional liability insurance underwriter for the majority of plastic surgeons. I do not have all the data, so shown here is a replicated graph from the study reporting on the top six plastic surgery claims by allegation category. Note that failure to obtain consent is listed as only 3% of allegations. The overwhelming majority of claims fall under the allegation category of improper performance of surgery and totaling to 49%. What is key here is that improper performance of surgery was often alleged when the surgical outcome differed from what the patient expected. Only 5% of the total claims actually involved substandard care. It was further noted that a number of these claims arose from complications that were known to the patient as a risk of the procedure and the documentation showed that the potential risks were discussed with the patient prior to surgery. This is important as the extent of the issue of miscommunication during informed consent may be much larger than is currently understood. Shown here is a graphic of identified failure points in the informed consent process, categorized. Miscommunication occurs when there is a failure in one or more parts of the informed consent process. Deficits in the current practice of informed consent are a failure in preparation, conversation, presentation, or documentation. These procedures are inherently preference sensitive, meaning there are often several clinically appropriate options and therefore the decision should largely be based on the patient's informed preferences and aligned with their goals and values. It has been recognized that clinician opinion of the best treatment option is often incongruent with that of the patient. In aesthetics, the patient is the ultimate judge of whether or not the outcome is successful which further highlights the importance of engaging in shared decision-making during the informed consent process. Reasons for discordance include failure to clarify patient goals, values, and preferences during the decision-making process, which may lead to patient dissatisfaction with treatment. These procedures are also largely absent from the shared decision-making research. Further complicating is the general lack of gold standards for performing these procedures. Informed consent in this clinical environment is unique 
and that patients often present for consultation with preconceived expectations of desired outcome and what treatment they need to achieve it. This may lead patients to rush to sign consent forms in an effort to expedite the process and get what they think they want rather than participate in shared decision making. The rise in popularity of digital and social media, including direct-to-consumer marketing, physician review sites, and consumer forums, contribute to the proliferation of misinformation about elective aesthetic procedures. Misinformation can be categorized as incorrect, biased, out-of-date, or incomprehensible. A large international study explored the influence of social media and easily accessible online information. They found in aesthetic plastic surgery practices that 95% of patients used the internet for information prior to their consultation, and 85% of plastic surgeons thought information found on social media could lead to unrealistic expectations. Related research looking at influences on decision-making for undergoing plastic surgery found that many patients had already done their homework and resolved most of their concerns about possible risks prior to consultation with a plastic surgeon. Furthermore, these procedures are increasingly being performed by practitioners other than board-certified plastic surgeons. A common misunderstanding is the credential of board-certified cosmetic surgeon being synonymous with board-certified plastic surgeon. The American Board of Cosmetic Surgery is not a recognized specialty by the American Board of Medical Specialties, rather a conglomerate of adjacent specialties that have received limited aesthetics training of varying quality, such as internal medicine, dermatology, and general surgery. Many patients commented that risks would be minimized if one thoroughly researched the procedure and found a skilled and experienced plastic surgeon. Additionally, when weighing the balance of benefits and risks, participants felt that the potential for negative outcomes was small and the potential benefits could be great. There is a lack of robust risk data on these procedures as rigorous research is difficult in aesthetics and in the case of breast implants, post-market surveillance data is often useless for drawing comparisons to inform decisions as differing methodology is used by differing manufacturers. Lastly, medical tourism and discounted procedures are a major issue. Patients seeking deals on cosmetic surgery often result in serious medical or financial complications requiring costly revisions, which is unique to this specialty. For comparison, you would never ask your cardiac surgeon if you could hold out for a buy one, get one bypass. The perception of informed consent from both patients and clinicians is that informed consent documents are a legal formality. Clinician belief is that the document is not meant to aid the process of informed consent, but to conclude it. Common themes from patients included annoyance with extensive length of the consent forms, reports of not actually reading the informed consent document because of length, feeling rushed, or belief that it was not necessary to read because they had already researched the procedure prior to the appointment, and desire for post-procedure photo examples of signs and symptoms that are normal versus very concerning along with the informed consent text. Shared decision-making is a process rooted in patient-centered care during which clinicians and patients collaborate to make informed care decisions that reflect the patient's goals and informed preferences. It includes use of decision support, such as patient decision aids, and has been found to improve patient knowledge, decision quality, satisfaction, and reduced decisional conflict. Perhaps most poignantly, a 2016 article published in the Aesthetic Surgery Journal puts forth that a shared decision-making process of communication, if properly performed and documented in the patient's record, would constitute perfected informed consent. Note that this was communicated two years ago.
literature supports that providing a standardized set of information through use of patient decision aids that are kept current by standards put forth by certifying bodies can notably reduce inherent cognitive biases that may impact a clinician's discussion of risks, benefits, burdens, and alternatives. The National Quality Forum cites that evidence demonstrates that decision aids and shared decision making have improved patient knowledge about options and their outcomes, increased accurate risk perception, resulted in better match between values and choices, reduced decisional conflict, and decreased the number of people who remain undecided about treatment. It is important to note that use of a patient decision aid does not automatically imply that shared decision making has been accomplished. Poor quality decision aids can contribute to patient harm by delivering misinformation. Certification and use of a valid measure of shared decision making is needed. In a recent ASAP survey, use of decision aids showed a statistically significant reduction in the likelihood of being sued for malpractice. However, 50% of those that reported use of a decision aid during informed consent stated that they did not follow up with an evaluation of patient comprehension. Shown here is the basic criteria for a patient decision aid. And shown here is the additional criteria required for certification. The clinical value compass was used to develop a comprehensive, balanced measure set for future program evaluation. Through performing a gap analysis, I discovered that there is consistency of broad information domains of risks, benefits, and alternatives. However, the breadth, depth, and presentation of this information is highly variable. Moreover, informed consent documents are not compliant with health literacy and numeracy guidelines. All of the consent documents reviewed used words or phrases such as may occur, rarely, or possibility of to communicate risk probabilities. Presentation of risk probabilities is a major component of decision science or the understanding of how and why people make decisions and is of critical importance when considering the ethical implications of informed consent. A recent editorial published in the Aesthetic Surgery Journal relates this specifically to plastic surgery and in the context of cognitive biases and heuristics. As we reviewed, the evidence shows that best practice for ensuring effective informed consent is accomplished through a process of shared decision-making with use of certified patient decision aids. Unfortunately, no patient decision aids that meet certification standards were found for use in elective aesthetic procedures. Shown here is a summary of where we are and where we want to go. On the left is a traditional informed consent document, and the right is a certified patient decision aid. Note the differences in risk communication. Lastly, note the high reading level of the informed consent document, approximately double what is recommended by National Health Literacy Guidelines. When each component of this process is individually examined, problems become clear and leverage points for improvement can be identified. Completion of some form of documentation to fulfill minimum legal requirements was identified as universal and is our leverage point for improvement.
This table compares informed consent documents and certified patient decision aids in meeting certification criteria and is organized by informed consent process area. It seems apparent that improvement efforts should focus on replacing current informed consent documents with patient decision aids that meet certification standards as published by the International Patient Decision Aid Standards, IPDAS, collaboration and endorsed by the National Quality Forum. I hope the significance of why the informed consent process should work for you, not against you, is becoming more clear. Our two global aims are first to establish a development process model for creating patient decision aids that meet certification standards to replace current informed consent documents for elective aesthetic procedures, specific aims, methodology with rationale and measure of success are defined per phase. Second, a prototype patient decision aid will be constructed for the selected pilot procedure of primary breast augmentation using the development process model. The end goal of the project is for both the development process model and prototype to be acceptable to end users. Starting with the development process model. Four specific aims align with the four phases of the project respectively. Supporting evidence for the informed consent problem addressed, context to elective aesthetic procedures, ethical and legal principles met, and conceptual or theoretical guidance are described for each phase of the development process model. The initial objective of the development process model is to establish expert consensus of procedure-specific core information considered essential for informed decision-making. A three-round Delphi consensus design will be used for determining expert consensus. The Delphi process has been recognized as a good method for reaching expert consensus on content for informed consent materials. The importance of involving clinicians in the development process is further emphasized as clinicians who do not trust the content of a patient decision aid are unlikely to encourage their patients to view it. The target clinician population is board certified plastic surgeons with a primarily aesthetics practice. An email will be sent out to active ASAPS members. The email will describe the study and will include a link to the survey using a web link connector via the SurveyMonkey platform and will also include required informed consent language per IRB. A screening question will be asked to confirm current active ASAPS membership. Responses are anonymized. According to ASAPS leadership, there are approximately 2,100 active ASAPS members. Using the SurveyMonkey online sample size calculator with a 95% confidence level and 5% margin of error, the sample size needed was determined to be 325 completed surveys. The survey content will include items covering demographics and current practices of informed consent process in addition to the items of concern in determining consensus. Consensus is sought about if each item should be considered essential for informed decision making and whether the chosen item should require confirmation of comprehension to be considered informed. Criteria for determining the operational definition of consensus and the precise methodology for conducting Delphi studies are topics of frequent debate in the literature, but a common theme is that best practice is to explicitly state the chosen measure of consensus and methodology of study a priori. For this project, consensus will be defined as a proportion within a range, 75% majority rating. Nine-point Likert scales will be used as this has been found to be more discerning than smaller scales.
the demographic and current practices data will be collected to ensure program participants were actually part of the target population and displayed as descriptive statistics. The concept of the core information set is defined as a minimum set of consensus-derived information about a given procedure to be discussed with all patients. It is intended to catalyze discussion of subjective importance to individuals and must be accomplished to determine what information patients need to understand. Listed here is the context as it relates to informed consent problems addressed. The context as it relates to elective aesthetic procedures. the ethical and legal context. AIM-2 seeks to gather patient input. Gaps in perception of information importance, preferences, and knowledge of treatment options, including associated risks, burdens, and expected outcomes, will be assessed through a consumer patient survey. This is designed as a single survey round. Potential participants will be recruited using the Amazon Mechanical Turk crowdsource platform and will be directed to SurveyMonkey via a web link containing the study description, required informed consent language per IRB, if potential participant agrees to participate. The target patient population sample will be purposive to reflect informational needs of patients considering primary breast augmentation. Inclusion criterion for eligibility is adult females considering primary breast augmentation surgery. Rationale for adult females is because this is the population for which breast implants are approved for use by the FDA. To ensure responses accurately reflect the informational needs of the target population, screening questions will be administered prior to the survey, including confirmation of age 18 years or older, sex assigned at birth, and if they have considered undergoing breast augmentation surgery. The sample size needed was determined to be 384 completed surveys. Survey questions will be based on the content listed here. The decision conflict scale will also be administered as it is a predictor of decision quality. The survey will close following receipt of adequate sample size as described. The theoretical and conceptual guidance for this phase. The context as it relates to the informed consent problems addressed. The specific context to elective aesthetic procedures. The legal and ethics context. AIM-3. Findings from the first two phases will be integrated to a prototype patient decision aid.
the prototype will follow the IPDAS Ottawa Decision Aid template shown here. The IPDAS checklist will be used as the process protocol for the development of the patient decision aid. The rationale is because it is based on rigorous criteria that is used as the basis for decision aid certification. Two members of the project committee will complete the evaluation and review if any inconsistencies are found. The planned evaluation is a post-test only design for acceptability of the certifiable patient decision aid prototype and the development process model. It is considered a formative evaluation. The rationale for this is the appreciation that if the end users of the patient decision aid do not believe the process or the decision aid itself to be acceptable, then there is no reason to continue with scaling up and spread to more elective aesthetic procedures. While the most basic of evaluation designs, failure to capture trust and engagement of the target recipients will render future efforts pointless. If either the prototype or the development process model is determined to be unacceptable, failures can be more easily identified and revised until an iteration that is acceptable is completed. If the prototype and development process model are found to be acceptable, I hope to make recommendations to adapt the prototype to a delivery format that will be most effective based on feedback from the acceptability study to implement its use and conduct an effective evaluation to determine the impact of the patient decision aid on decision quality using measures described earlier in the clinical value compass and to utilize the development process model to scale up and spread to more elective aesthetic procedures. The second part of this project is focused on using the development process model to create a prototype patient decision aid for primary breast augmentation. Primary breast augmentation was selected as the pilot procedure because it is the most commonly performed elective aesthetic surgery and because my practice partner believed that it would be the most beneficial. Round one survey items were generated based on a scoping review of the scientific and gray literature. An automated search strategy was utilized to review the scientific literature. Included databases were PubMed and PsycInfo. A manual search was performed of the Aesthetic Surgery Journal and the Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery Journal, as well as existing informed consent documents, patient education literature, and device manufacturer product safety inserts. The overarching question guiding the search was what information is essential for informed decision making for patients considering primary breast augmentation. Pilot testing was planned to be performed with USC plastic surgery residents for determining validity and reliability. The rationale being purposive 
to engage the next generation of plastic surgeons in shared decision making and informed consent improvement efforts. However, this was changed during IRB review because it was going to require additional involvement of USC IRB. Following IRB approval, I was informed that the ASAP's board had recently determined that their members were receiving too many surveys, so now surveys needed to be approved by the board prior to administration. So while this further delayed implementation, it was actually a great opportunity to gain leadership buy-in. The first survey was rejected, but with the recommendation to revise and resubmit. Reasons for rejection were mainly the survey being too long, belief that the survey would upset members, and questioning why participating in a PhD project. It was also recognized that it should upset members because it is a big problem. The initial survey was 32 questions with an estimated time for completion of 20 minutes. It was revised into two surveys that are 15 questions each with an estimated time for completion of 10 minutes. Additionally, I changed the language in the email cover letters from you are invited to participate in a quality improvement research project entitled Improving the Effectiveness of Informed Consent and Elective Aesthetic Procedures to ASAPS is upgrading your informed consent process to work for you, not against you. The revised versions were accepted and are scheduled to be sent to all active ASAPS members next month. The rationale for performing a scoping review of the scientific and gray literature instead of a more strict systematic review and meta-analysis is that the latter would be more time consuming and involve more resources. With the appreciation that there is a possibility that the entire development process model could be found unacceptable by end users, I felt it was appropriate to sacrifice increased rigor for increased efficiency of the pilot. This can certainly be adapted over time. While the prototype in this project is planned for a paper-based format, translation to digital platform would be ideal for adoption, as this would allow for the patient decision aid to be initiated prior to consultation, since the majority of patients considering elective aesthetic procedures seek information online prior to presenting for consultation, why not teach when patients actually want to learn? Key opinion literature exploring options for incentivizing clinicians posit potential for premium discounts on professional liability insurance with demonstrated use of certified patient decision aids in their practice. This makes sense as evidence strongly supports reduced liability with their use. Policy implications include reform of informed consent laws, as can be seen in Washington State, where shared decision making is recognized as prima facie evidence of informed consent when a certified patient decision aid has been used as certified by the Washington State Healthcare Authority. Implications for education include moving to a transdisciplinary model for learning about the informed consent process rather than learning in silos respective of one's home discipline, be it medicine, nursing, law, ethics, public health, or policy. The attitudes toward shared decision-making and informed consent are completely different. Shared decision-making conjures a positive connotation, while informed consent typically draws a negative one, an audible sigh, or immediately tuning out. It does make sense, given the culture, that informed consent is commonly seen as a legal formality and the pervasive litigation surrounds its failures. No one ever alleges failure in shared decision-making in a malpractice claim.
In preparing this presentation and in thinking how to best present the DNP essentials and program outcomes met, I reflected on my personal statement submitted with my DNP application. Are patients truly informed about their condition and the treatment options, risks, benefits, and alternatives? What about the limitations of treatment? Unfortunately, no. Does the process of informed consent carry weight when evaluating patient safety and satisfaction outcomes? Yes. Do we inform to educate or to mitigate litigation? And if the answer leans towards the latter, what measures can be taken to shift the culture of thought to the former? The answer here can be found in our gap analysis. And I believe that replacing traditional informed consent documents with certified patient decision aids is a great start for improvement. Do we see any trends between varying disciplines or varying institutions? There have been some pretty great advancements in shared decision making, but we have a long way to go to realize its full potential in improving the effectiveness of informed consent. It is interesting to note that specialties that are paid through insurance reimbursement have exhibited the most improvement, as with CMS oversight and shifting to pay for value, quality reporting corresponds to negative or positive payment adjustments. Elective aesthetic procedures remain fee for service. Are patients better informed when consented by a nurse practitioner when compared to a physician? I now understand that I was actually trying to articulate a more fundamental question here, being how can the expertise of nursing be leveraged to add value and improve patient outcomes during the informed consent process? The answer that I have come up with is that nursing is the process. Lastly, do the educational preparation and philosophy of the provider impact their ability to educate patients? Not necessarily. It is truly a systems problem. As reviewed, the study and practice of informed consent is inherently interdisciplinary, and it should also be better recognized as such in both areas, respectively. Instead of attempting improvement efforts and receiving education on the informed consent process in silos, education, research, practice, and policy efforts should be conducted in a transdisciplinary fashion. These questions have been answered. And I am still confident that I can make a difference. So let us now reflect on the DNP program outcomes and essentials. I believe all have been reasonably met with the understanding that this does not represent finality, but that a foundational understanding has been achieved to be able to engage in continuous learning, improvement, and truly transform health. To conclude, we now return to our main idea. The informed consent process should work for you, not against you. Shared decision-making is a shared responsibility. We all have a role to play in making a difference, and I hope this project presentation has provided some insight and inspiration for how. Thank you so much for your time and attention, and I look forward to any questions or comments.